come with all the corrections. Oh, yeah, a t equal to tc, yeah. what's happened is the density has a big jump. Let's see. Yeah, you see, the correction on the critical temperature or in the order parameter here on the population of the ground state depends on if it is attractive or repulsive depletation. If it is attractive, it's like in this approximation, particles get together, the effect is like increasing the density, okay, in this, in this system. If it is repulsive, it's like particles getting far apart. n is 0 is equal to 0. And then uh, I have a correction here. So if I make this equal to 0, I can tell you what is the, crit the new critical temperature in terms of the ideal system of critical temperature. So maybe this is the confusion. Tc0 is the critical temperature of the same system if you make it gamma equal to 0, OK? Right? Don't sleep. I have a very good joke. And uh, we're giving out a price for whoever stay more awake. <laughs> did, did I answer the question? OK. So uh, now what we're going to do is build up an equation in a more serious basis. So I wrote a Hamiltonian. And why I did that simple approximation before is to tell you that adding here a term proportional to the wave function square is natural. It's like saying that interaction goes proportional to the density, right? Because wave function square comes to be density. And in this system where all the functions will be the same, if I multiply by the number of particles here, minus 1, but I take the minus 1 away because n is much bigger than 1. So this basically gives the density there in some sense. Okay, But I want to solve. I want to get this wave function. So I just take now the, this, vari this uh, uh, functional, and I minimize. But I cannot minimize in any sense. I have to minimize this with a constraint. And the constraint is that the total number of particles is in my system. And variations on the energy has to be related with variation in the number. That's the only way of varying energy. So this is a constraint. And if I minimize this, Taking this constraint using Lagrange multiplier that I'm sure you're very familiar with, or if you are not yet, it uh, will be very soon if you are undergraduate. Sooner, you're going to have to deal with this guy. Then I come with an equation, which is called gross pitayevsky equation. What I want to point out for you is that the eigen, normally this is called nonlinear Schrodinger equation. I only put in the time independent one. OK? But, uh, the eigenvalue of the gross pitayevsky equation is not the energy per particle in your system. It's the chemical potential. They are only equal when there is no interaction in the system, as I'm going to show to you if I can go through. So this is the gross pitayevsky and everybody uses. It's still mean field approximation, right? And uh, instead of treating this Hamiltonian, or instead of forget about this term, and this will be the energy of your system. But because of this nonlinear term, the eigenvalue of the gross pitayevsky is not the uh, eigen the energy per particle in your system is um, the chemical potential. But of course, once you have the chemical potential, the chemical potential is the derivative of the energy with respect to the number of particles. If there is no interaction. Of course, the this is uh, E is equal to, uh, <coughs> if there is no interaction, E is equal to any mu, because mu is the energy there, as I showed before, when you condensate. Then the derivative gives you mu. But if, it is, if there is interaction, this is not true. This does need to be true. OK? So once I have uh, the wave function, then I can calculate the energy of my system going back to the functional. And of course, A is a term very similar to the one I did in a very hand wave type, which is proportional to the scattering length and can be positive or negative. So in fact, this equation here 
is the equation that describes the interacting Bose gas, and everybody uses. Oh, sorry, it's missing a. F it's not phi 3, it's phi, phi squared times phi, times phi. I, it's a mistake, sorry. You have to add here a phi. Thank you. It is right there. Yeah, sorry, I, this is a, a night problem. Uh, not eating enough, this kind of thing. You, 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 <laughs> yeah, you start to eat the functions. <laughs> if you're not eating enough. That's why we have this dinner tonight. So you don't eat functions, you eat uh, meat. Okay, it's missing a phi here, sorry. But uh, so the Hamiltonian that we're gonna deal with is this Hamiltonian that I give you here, okay? And of course, when you're gonna do the equation, you multiply this, if it is a time dependent, then I H D D T of phi is equal to H phi. You know this very well, right? A lot of people in this room work very deeply with uh, gross bitayevsk so I have to be careful. But gross bitayevsk is nice because uh, even experimentalists can understand. And uh, better than that, in some situations we can solve. Isn't that right? Okay, so we have the equation. Now we have to solve. And there are approximations that we make to solve this equation. The first one is the Thomas Fermi. What is Thomas Fermi? Well, I get that equation. Remember, the Hamiltonian has a p squared divided by 2m, which is that Laplacian. And if the sigma has a strong interaction, if this term is very big, kinetic energy is somehow not important. So cross that away. The equation I end with is this one. And this is called Thomas Fermi approximation. It's in a regime of very strong interaction in your Boson system. And once I have that, this is the equation, right? That I have. This is the chemical potential. And this equation, everybody can solve, right? This is an algebraic, algebraic equation. You eliminate, this is phi squared is equal to this. And this cannot be anything. There is a moment where this goes to zero. So the wave function goes to zero there. And the wave function square goes to zero. And as you know, this cannot be negative. Stops there. So that's why Ketely made a, that plot that in a harmonic oscillator, the wave function is not the Gaussian anymore, but is zero, builds up a parabola, comes back to zero. Because if the potential is a parabola, <coughs> the wave function square, which is the density, follows exactly that. There is a boundary where the particle exists, and when this is zero, which means the potential is equal to the chemical potential, you determine the boundary, the volume that particles can leave in this approximation. And outside this region, the wave function is zero. So let's solve this for a harmonic trap, which uh, is the most popular around. If you have a harmonic potential, then uh, <coughs> u is a half of m omega square r square. And of course, the integral has to be 1, right? This is a wave function per particle, for one particle. Would be n if it is the total. Then uh, where, where is this space that I have to integrate? I just make the potential equal to mu. Then I get that uh, the volume that's occupied by the particle is given by this radio. So my integral does need to go from 0 to infinite. Goes to 0 to r, because outside r, the wave function goes to 0 anyway. So when I do this integral, which is just substitute the things here, is, is trivial. <coughs> this is the function that I did before there. You falling, George? Okay. So when I do this integral, the only thing here will be mu. And I can determine, remember, A has n on it, the scattering length. And I, I, I to simplify things, I'm working everything in terms of uh, the characteristic length of the harmonic oscillator, which is this L. So mu for this system is given by this expression, just by doing this integral here. So I have mu. 
Okay? So I have mu. This is the chemical potential of my system, which is a kind of eigenvalue in the <coughs> gross pitayevsky equation. But I did in this approximation of strong interaction, which is you don't need to do numerically and everything. Now, since mu is defined as the variation of the energy with the number, and I have a mu there, this should be in the same way. See, mu here goes with n to the 2 fifths. Then I ask, what is the function which derivative gives you n to the 2 fifths? You find very easy. Has to be n to the 7 fifths. Because when you take the derivative, give you 2 fifths. And there is a constant here that's very easy to determine. So this is the energy of my system, which is completely different from the chemical potential. OK? So that's somehow is the energy per particle I have in my system that would be the eigenvalue of the Schrodinger, real Schrodinger equation. Everybody follow me? No, I didn't put anything. If you solve the time-independent gross pitayevsky equation, what are you getting as an eigenvalues is a nonlinear equation. But what comes out is the chemical potential. OK? No, just uh, that's what I want to say. And then I approximate. I say, throw away the kinetic energy, and I solve the problem for the harmonic oscillator. And I show to you the chemical potential and the real energy per particle in your system are different. In fact, the real energy per particle in your system is 5 sevenths of mu. It's near, but it's not exactly. Right? So normally, the wave function in a, in a, in a system, like in a harmonic oscillator, will have a Gaussian type of profile. But in the Thomas Fermi approximation, it starts here and dies here. And this is what people observe when they produce Bose condensation with a very high number. Because if you have a very high number, A, the term A in the gross pitayevsky equation is much bigger than the other terms. And you can do this approximation. OK. Oh, no, I'm going to jump this. That's the only way of solving gross pitayevsky equation? No. There are other ways, and we like it very much, me and a few friends around. Here, girls and boys, the renormalized perturbation theory. And if you have any question, you can ask uh, Lillian and uh, Edimir. And what consists of this approximation in my point of view? Maybe their point of view is a little different. But suppose we have a harmonic oscillator, and we're going to write down the Hamiltonian, which is the gross pitayevsky equation. And here, I'm going to, uh, this is the equation, right? Then I'm going to just uh, normalize everything to get a uh, hidden of units. So remember, instead of uh, A, going to appear a G, which is what we call interacting parameter. Phi 4, right? Phi 4. Hamiltonian. <coughs> no, Hamiltonian is phi square. This is just the Hamiltonian. OK? Then the Hamiltonian is just rewritten this way, OK? <coughs> so lambda here is the normalized frequency. I just divide everything by those units. So I'm expressing energy in units of h bar omega <coughs> and length in units of uh, the characteristic uh, harmonic oscillator length. OK, so this is Hamilton, and I want to solve this. So the question is, how much different this is from this? This is a simple harmonic oscillator. And you're going to say, oh, it's very different. Here, we don't have this term. But maybe it's possible to adjust this parameter, which is related to frequency, to compensate the interaction. So what we do then is the following. We know the solution for H0, which is a harmonic oscillator. Right? Just a harmonic oscillator. So we solve this. The, we know the solution. Then we know that uh, the two Hamiltonians differ by this amount. And then we calculate what is the variation of energy to the, this variation, like we do in perturbation theory. 
Then we correct the energy, and then we take the derivative of this energy with respect to B, which is basically the frequency of the ideal harmonic oscillator. And then we fit back. So we find the best B, we fit back and keep going. So this is a combination of perturbation theory and variational principle. And you end, when you minimize and you get the best you can, you have the eigenvalues of your problem. Because this is real energy. Because it comes from the sandwich here. OK? So that's another way of solving gross pitayevsky equation. And when you do that, you can find, for example, the ground state energy of your system. If you have uh, some number of particles, remember that G is proportional to A, which has the number of particles in it. If, J goes to, if G goes to 0, of course, there is no interaction. You have to get as energy 3 halves of h bar omega. Now, let's, as an example, <coughs> consider the case where E, where A, the scattering length, is negative, which means an attractive system. If you have an attractive system, as I showed you yesterday, the system is going to present instability. And if you do this calculation, and uh, I had a student, uh, Alex uh, Gama, which is now in Bahia, that did a thesis on this. If you solve, suppose that G is negative, because the scattering is negative. And then you solve the problem, and you start to vary the number of particles. Suddenly, you get a, a complex eigen energy. And you all know what means a complex energy, right? Means an unstable system. And this, in fact, uh, was measured by Handy Hewlett. Handy Hewlett was able to produce a Bose condensation with lithium-7, which has a negative scattering length. And what he found out, he found out as, as, as he builds up the condensate, suddenly this system collapses. So the condensate is stable up to a critical number. And then it collapses. And then we ask the question, how can we find the critical number? Easy. Solve the equation and ask the question when the energy became complex. At that point, you find that you have a critical value for this when that became complex. And if you convert back in numbers, you get the maximum number you can put in a condensate with negative scattering length that still makes the condensate stable. Above this value, it collapses. So uh, what uh, Handy observed was like uh, you build up a condensate, so you accumulate num particles, and suddenly, choop. OK? And of course, if you have the eigenvalue, it's complex. The complex part gives you the lifetime. So you can even calculate how long this will live. And it turns to be a few milliseconds. And this number turns to be close to 1,000, which agrees quite well with experiments. OK? So negative scattering length is a problem. Maybe it's good to make molecules, but it's not good for having a condensate. Maybe you make a molecule, and the molecule will stay there, because molecule to molecule will have a positive uh, kind of interaction, but uh, if you have a negative. So this is basically, uh, <coughs> it's not the end. Don't get happy yet. So this is. Now when you hear about uh, Grosbytayevsk, Thomas Fermi, I know them. A lot of you know very well this. Some of you dream with this all the time, right? But uh, for us, it's nice to know where is that. <coughs> OK. Now for the last minute, I would like to give a few things that I think will be important for the other talks. And one of them is. Bose condensation in a lattice. And we're going to do a problem here. I was going to give you problem sets, but uh, that I, I'm doing myself. I'm a good teacher. I give you the problem set, and I solve. And the first problem we're going to do is, let's consider we have an optical lattice. Remember I put a picture yesterday? Is that the configuration of potential wells distribute in two dimensions? And we're going to fill it up this lattice, but we're going to fill it up in a very specific way. We're going to put all the particles that we can in a ground state. OK? 
remember, I have a multiple wells. They have an energy state. So all the particles are in the ground state of each well. Do you understand? OK, then I leave there. Now I'm going to adiabatically turn the lattice down. The question is, what occupation number for the lattice I need to have so that when I destroy the lattice, I end with a condensate? Because normally what people do is produce a condensate, drop in an optical lattice. So the particles are so cold, they go to the ground state. So I have this multiple well, and all the particles are in the ground state. Now I want adiabatically remove. And the question is, do I always end with a condensate? So let's answer this question, right? So uh, this uh, psi is the occupation of the lattice. If it is one, means I have one atom per site of the lattice, per potential well. If it is less than one, means that the lattice is not complete full, it's partial empty. Everybody's following me? Say yes. OK. Remember, I have a present here. Is a, oh, I don't, can, I don't, I can't say what it is. It shakes. <laughs> OK, so let's do this calculation. Because I'm sure that uh, half of the talks will be in lattices from today on. And uh, it's nice to know what is the occupation, what is this, when I have, when I don't have things. So this is a good exercise for us to remind things. There is no more than one agent per site? No, no, in my situation, I have filling up the lattice is like one, OK? Of course, in some situations, you can put two, but, uh, okay, but the situation is one, one, at most one. I consider a lattice that is complete filled when I put one atom in each site, and zero complete empty, OK? Now, let's remember what it is adiabatic. Everybody knows what's adiabatic. What's adiabatic? That's when the entropy doesn't change, right? This is adiabatic in the thermodynamic sense. So, uh, OK, just keep that in mind. 